My name is Sarkan Batun and I am a, a research associate at uh, NewFab, Northwestern uh, Micronano Fabrication Facility. Today I will be your host and we will be talking about uh, e beam lithography here at NewFab. And my uh, opening image here, you can see it's a grading pattern. It's a very large area compared to e beam lithography standards. I'm sure if any one of you has made these kind of structures can appreciate it. But uh, it's on glass, and uh, you know, glass comes other like uh, charging problems uh, and whatnot. And we can do these kind of things, right? So it's just showcasing that. All right, so let's begin. Uh, here. All right, so I just first want to give a little bit of a shout out to our facilities. You know, we are at New One Center at Northwestern. We have various facilities at uh, different places in uh, Evanston campus. Uh, different electron microscopes, uh, transmission electron microscopes. Uh, we have uh, scan prop imaging facilities, surface science. You can do all kinds of crazy things. And we are NewFab, and we uh, are at Tech and Cook. And uh, let me get my laser pointer. And we are a class 100 clean room facility. Uh, we uh, give uh, we have instruments that can help you make all kinds of different devices. Some of them uh, I just uh, listed over here, but you know it's not limited to these ones. Uh, we have complete suits of fabrication tools, character like simple characterization tools for device fabrication. So just uh, don't hesitate to reach out and you know check our website and uh, newly updated website. I must I must add, and uh, you know we're happy to help you. Now, I just uh, want to uh, showcase a few of the stuff that has been made and people continuously are yeah, making these kind of things in our instrument, ABL instrument. Uh, some of them are like you can make uh, X-ray zone plates, very large zone plates, uh, I might add, and you can make uh, different kinds of uh, like mathematical curves and uh, like uh, some complicated waveguide structures uh, uh, like that. And you can make pretty tight plasmonic uh, structures uh, with, with very small gaps. Uh, I believe we were able to get out to maybe like uh, 11, 13 nanometers gap between these dimers. And uh, you know, this is Teriodom's uh, group's work. And uh, we made some quantum devices in the lab and with very, very tight gaps between the metals. So this was a memory device. Uh, that we were making for somebody else. And uh, we had this uh, interesting thing that was over a two millimeter in diameter. It was a metal lens that used sort of like a flat lens to be used for edge detection. Again, another kind of uh, cool plasmonic structures over very large areas. And this one uh, is another interesting thing that was needed to be done over like centimeter scale, two by three centimeter uh, square area with about, and it's not very challenging in terms of EBL standards. You know, the line with here is 700, 800 nanometers. However, you know, it's a very large area and it needs to be done in a reasonable amount of time. And we were able to do this in about like one and a half hour. And uh, this is a pretty cool uh, wave launcher, you know, made by Lucini Group in, in our lab. All right. So, a few things, and you know, there are a lot more. And uh, we, will, we are happy to share if you share your uh, great work with us. All right. And this one kind of shows the limits of the instrument. Uh, so this is like the, the smallest line width we have achieved so far is uh, seven and a half nanometers. And the periodicity you can see you see on the right hand side is uh, yeah about like thirty five nanometers. So you can make tight, very dense structures like this. I mean these are on photoresist and you know, on e beam resist, obviously. So you know they don't mean much by itself, but you know. Uh, you can easily turn them into practical applications. So this is just to give you a little bit of an idea of what can be done with the machine. All right. Now, in 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 this talk, uh, I'll start with a little bit of uh, electron beam lithography background, and uh, but mostly I will be talking about like you know the tool itself, the Voyager one hundred, and like materials we provide to you, uh, and you can bring your own materials too, obviously, and some uh, uh, process steps for your uh, processes, right? All right, now what is e-beam lithography, right? It's basically patterning with electrons. 
And why we need electrons? Because it allows us to do very small features like sub 10 nanometer scales as I shown before. And uh, the downside is that, you know, it's a serial process. You know, we expose each pattern pixel by pixel, which means, uh, you know, it takes a long time, right? So we always try to, you know, uh, renew our machines, just get state-of-the-art uh, lithography tools because, you know, technology is advancing and things are getting faster and faster and we can get larger structures, right? Now, how it works. I'm sure most of you are familiar with electron uh, scanning electron microscope uh, by now and if you're not already familiar with it there was a great talk by my colleagues Tears and nick a few months back uh, you can just uh, go ahead and after this talk obviously <laughs> uh, at uh, you know in youtube and it's uh, available there and uh, you can get a lot more uh, detail about how these scanning electron microscopes work but in a nutshell we have an electron column that has some fancy uh, optics that focuses the electron beam into a pixel on our sample. By the help of these scan coils, we scan the beam in, uh, in, in, a, in a predefined fashion, like basically it will scan all the uh, scan area. And it, by uh, uh, recording the uh, signal from the detector, we can generate these nice images, right? But in the case of uh, electron beam lithography, we run the machine in reverse, obviously, uh, you know, uh, basically, right? So you start with a CAD design, uh, which has some shape uh, that you want to make on your sample. And this, uh, the software will tell the pattern generator how to scan the beam across the surface to generate these shapes on the surface, right? So it feeds this data to the scan coils. And we also need that one other crucial component, a fast beam blanker because the you know, beam usually needs to jump from one point to another, one object to another. So that's why uh, we uh, have this uh, extra component here and in, in most dedicated uh, electron beam brightness. And obviously you will need a resist on your sample because you know without resist, there's nothing to pattern. And the, uh, the idea is uh, we're just chemically modifying the resist as we pass our electron beam across it. Right? And then uh, we will develop it and then uh, we have our shapes on the surface. Now, here is our tool uh, with the generous uh, funding from a National Science Foundation. We were able to acquire this. Uh, uh, it was a pretty uh, long and uh, uh, painful process. Uh, I'm not very painful, but tedious, I would say, because it kind of coincided with COVID shutdowns and everything. So we had a lot of delays and uh, other kind of things, but we finally got it. And it was a long, craved tool here at Northwestern uh, because uh, we were limited with uh, uh, you know, Quanta and, and which is a great machine in on itself but you know, in terms of EBM writing it's a bit limited because you know you cannot really do stitching and that limits your uh, you know, area of exposure so that you know we had to uh, use uh, like small areas and then to come up with uh, elaborate and very detailed uh, uh, micro spectrometers and whatnot to be able to measure from such small areas. But nowadays, you know, we have this tool and we can make very large area stuff very easily and you can even just use your everyday pocket spectrometer to uh, measure your devices, right? And here are some like key, uh, uh, key uh, 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 aspects of this machine. Uh, it's about three nanometer beam size, which is pretty common with, you know, state-of-the-art uh, uh, beam machines. This one is a 50 kV machine. This is, uh, you know, basically most uh, dedicated e-beam writers are characterized by its uh, accelerating voltage. And so this is sort of like a mid-range machine. So 50 kV, there are 100 kV machines. There's one in uh, Chicago and one in uh, Argonne. And uh, we have this K uh, 50 kV machine and electron, like uh, SEM converted machines are typically run between 5 kV to 30 kV. So, each have their own applications, but you know, uh, it, this is just what it is. We have a pretty uh, big pattern processor. It's a 20 bit uh, pattern processor, which basically eliminates all the considerations that are necessary for pixel positioning, because you know there's plenty of pixels uh, uh, that you can use uh, within your right field. So you don't really need to worry about some things that we used to worry about when we do uh, uh, EBL. So uh, there's some nice thing about uh, being a user of this machine. It has fairly decent overlay and uh, uh, stitch field accuracy if you kind of uh, be patient with it and know 
the tricks around it. And uh, this, again, this is how we can make uh, those large area patterns with virtually no uh, error uh, in between them. And uh, we have this interferometric stage, which can travel along 100 by 100 millimeter square area. Uh, again, so you can just load your four inch wafer and pattern the entire surface with it. Uh, that's one of the beautiful things about it. And when we ordered the machine, we get it this fixed beam moving stage exposure technique, which is quite useful, uh, making waveguides and stuff like that. And I will talk about it briefly uh, this talk as well. All right. So now, uh, in you know, nitty gritty details over here. So how it works, right? So you start with this uh, CAD design. You know, you have some uh, shapes of your devices or whatever uh, you're trying to make. But obviously the machine is not going to see it like that, right? This pattern generator, pattern generator is going to pixelate it and it's going to create something like this. And you are free to choose. Uh, so these are called like in, in uh, X direction, so to speak, uh, it's called a step size. And in Y direction, it's the line spacing of basically your pixel size. In, 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 uh, in uh, polygons like these, we typically use them equal, but uh, so basically uh, electron beam tool is going to shot pixels across the surface and it will generate this shape. Now, how does it calculate how much it needs to wait? It is governed with this equation over here, right? The dose is the energy you impart on your photoresist and each photoresist is, I, I may use photoresist and e-beam resist interchangeably because you know we are a fabrication lab, we use uh, resist all the time. So photoresist is kind of more common term for these things. But when I say photoresist, please keep in mind that I'm talking about e-beam resist, all right? So your resist, uh, depending on the type of resist you're using, it usually have a fixed dose and you don't really have much uh, uh, much freedom choosing that. But you can choose your beam current. More beam current means more electrons, means uh, more energy uh, expo uh, imp imparted to the resist. Uh, so uh, if you increase your beam current, for example, you may need to uh, decrease your dwell time. Dwell time is the time the beam weights at each pixel, right? Now, the step size and the line spacing comes uh, with, you know, you have to be, again, smart about your uh, choice of these size things based on the minimum feature size you are interested in to make. Uh, but uh, the nice thing about these kind of machines is that, you know, it, it basically calculates everything automatically based on other given parameters for you. So it will make a nice coverage. So let's say we're making this rectangle pattern over here, right? So it will calculate the dwell time according to what you want to make. But, you know, these are, these things are not really uh, independently choosable uh, most of the time. So you will need to be smart about it, but it is going to uh, make most of the choices for you. Now, you can just imagine, you know, if you have fixed line spacing or fixed pixel size between these things, you know, the, the beam we mostly considered as a point source when we shot the beam at a pixel, you know, your pixel size will be much larger than the beam diameter most of the time. By increasing the dwell time, you can increase the area of the effective dose. And, you know, this these things will coalesce and just expose the entire area for you. If you have shorter dwell time with a fixed uh, pixel, uh, you know, step size and line spacing, obviously you know you're not going to cover uh, the entire area, and you have uh, uh, less uh, less than ideal dose on your uh, substrate. So in turn, you will need to compensate by reducing your step size. Right? Okay. Now here are some real life examples of how this machine scans different types of objects you may have in your designs. Uh, most common one is obviously polygons. And uh, I deliberately choose uh, line spacing twice the uh, uh, step size here so that we can see what's really going on. Uh, for stuff like these, like uh, these are called like Manhattan uh, uh, shapes uh, in, like, in the industry. Uh, so they're all like uh, perpendicular edges and whatnot. It, it won't really matter, just so you know, machine always prioritize the longest edge in any shape and it will align the pixels uh, with that edge, which is going to make like, this line smoother than this line, for example, right? That's just 
you know how it is making it but since we're choosing uh equal step size and uh, uh uh line spacing all the time for these kind of uh, rectangular uh, uh polygons uh it really doesn't matter but it it becomes important when you have off angle patterns like you know uh, some random angle polygons again it's going to prioritize the longest edge of the shape and the pixels will line up that so when you uh just uh, image your designs and you have some so you have your triangle but you know, it's a bit wonky at the tip and whatnot this could be causing it and we can investigate with your uh, own patterns so just uh, let us know and we can uh, take a look the most important thing that you need to know is that when you create circles you have two options you can draw the circle in the rate software and it is going to uh, understand it as a circle and it is going to make a polar exposure like that which in turn will give you a very nice circular profile but if you use an outside gds editor such as k layout the circles will be actually polygons with many many vertices and it is going to interpret it as a polygon and it kind of randomly chooses which uh, uh, angle to align these uh, pixels and you know in the end your circles may not look like nice circles and this is mostly why it happens All right now i was i talked about a little bit at the beginning like you know the, the ebl machines are characterized by their uh, accelerator voltage ours is a 50 kV machine and you can see from these uh, monte carlo simulations a lot better why is that now, assume we are using a, a relatively thick resist such as 500 nanometer PMMA on silicon substrate. What happens is when electrons, you know, enters to the material, you know, they start scattering and this is how their scattering profile looks like. The color shows the imparted uh, energy, basically your dose, and you'll have this kind of uh, uh, dispersion as it goes, uh, you know, as the electrons goes through the material. In comparison, when you uh, look at a 50 kV tool, you know, this uh, imparted energy is much, much narrow, uh, which will allow you to make densely packed patterns uh, without resist collapse. All right. Now, you know, it's not a bad thing, at, you know, uh, to have this kind of uh, dispersion, uh, you know, when you uh, expose your resist, because, you know, this, this will produce a natural undercut. So typically, uh, when you are using a, a low KV machine, you don't even need some fancy bilayer uh, resist processing to do nice metal liftoff. Uh, just using a 10 KV machine, a single layer PMMA can give you a very nice undercut profile, provided that you know your features are well separated. That you know if they are too close, then you know you'll see uh, resist collapsing, so that you know, you'll end up with nothing uh, in the return. But in that case, you know you'll need to up uh, your uh, 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 accelerating potential. Now we don't change this, although the machine is capable of running at low KVs. The problem is that you know as soon as you change the KV, you will need to wait like uh, three, four hours to uh, stabilize the uh, column. It it just doesn't work in our case, so we always keep it at fifty KV. And obviously, you know when you go the other direction, uh, you'll get even better sets. Uh, most of our users. Uh, typically use like 200 to 300 uh, nanometer thick uh, resists in their processes. So, uh, you know, it, in order to get like high resolution stuff with a thin, uh, with a lower KV machine, you know, if you are limited to that, you, know, you can always use a thinner resist and again, you'll get uh, better results in that way. So there's always a trade-off at some point. All right. Now, this machine can use two different writing techniques. Uh, the most common one, and all EV machines uh, actually use that, is the stitch and go technique. You can see these dashed lines over here. These are called right fields. That is basically the area the beam can scan at once. And you can choose this area size between uh, uh, 25 micron to uh, 500 micron in our machine. Typically, uh, for better uh, stitching accuracy, we use 100 micron right field, but uh, you know, you still have, you may still have some uh, stitching errors uh, at the stitch boundaries over here, and which is usually uh, not a big deal for most applications. Uh, but you know, if you're making a waveguide or something like that, needs to be uh, uh, something that is need to be uh, continuous across the entire field uh, and entire writing area. 
then uh, you may have more losses than you uh, wanted. For example, you know, that, let's say you're making a waveguide that is a few centimeters long, and you know, that will constitute you know, maybe hundreds of right fields. And at, at each field boundary, if you have a little bit of mismatch, you know, it, they will add up and get pretty lossy waveguide, right? So to combat that, we actually uh, uh, purchased this option called FBMS that is a uh, fixed beam moving stage type of thing. And it, it, it's uh, very good at making like long interconnects or uh, the waveguide type structures. What happens basically is that uh, beam stays stationary in the middle of the uh, right field and the stage moves under it and just uh, in a specific pattern to uh, make this uh, waveguide shape. So you can choose between uh, this uh, stitch and go to the uh, 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 FPMS method based on what you want to make, right? And typically, even if you want to make a waveguide, you know, you'll have some launchers and things like that, like some uh, gratings at the end of the waveguide, and then we, we mix and match these things, right? So we use stitch and go for some patterns, and then we switch to FPMS to make the uh, rest of the thing. Now, uh, I have some tips if you are interested uh, on how to make the best of it. Like, you know, if, you know most users just use the Chengo technique, obviously. And uh, just, you know, the most important thing I can tell you is just, you know, you, you need to be patient with the machine, all right? You don't want to rush into things. Just load your sample and wait at least like half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, I know it sounds frustrating, but that's just how all the machines are. The, the reason why we need to wait is because, you know, you're loading your sample on a huge chunk of aluminum and we're putting in the uh, uh, chamber and things needs to get acclimated. You know, we're uh, making, we're talking about nanometer precision here, small temperature fluctuations will induce a lot of uh, uh, stitching errors inside the uh, uh, chamber. So, you know, you just need to wait until things settle down. Uh, you can always use smaller right fields, but then you pay for like a stage travel time so it's not uh, that ideal but you know that's something you can think about it and uh, your field calibration and you know routines you know these are all explained in trainings uh, you need to uh, make sure to do all of them properly and uh, make sure you meet uh, threshold of your birds all right let's keep going and here are some beautiful uh, FBMS examples uh, so this one is like a three millimeter across uh, science spiral pattern. I mean, this is not a device or anything. I was just uh, uh, tinkering with it and uh, just created this uh, 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 science spiral pattern. So it's a, basically a sine wave spiraling outwards, and it it did it beautifully. I mean, it's just uh, amazing. You know, think you know it can do these kind of things. You know, you have to think about like a huge, I don't know, fifteen kilogram of stage moving uh and doing this wavy motion without uh losing pace and it's really amazing when you think about it all right now one nice thing about this machine i talked a little bit uh, is that it can efficiently make large areas this stuff some, some of the stuff uh we made was not really possible like a few you know maybe uh, five years ago uh, that uh, i've never seen anything like it actually so you know I talked about this pattern a little bit, like it was a random mesh network and we're able to do this like two by three centimeter things in about one and a half hour. There was another user who wanted to make eight by eight millimeter square area of 100 nanometer disks of 300 nanometer pitch. Now, if we made this uh, using standard operating procedures that we have with the machine, uh, it would have taken us like over 20 hours to write this, all right? And there are, it's it's not just the exposure time because you know this these dense patterns create enormous amount of data to the pattern generator and it takes time to uh, work with that data right so uh, we uh, reached out to uh, rate and then they uh, told us some there's a basically a hack we can do with the machine and we sort of uh, bypass all those overhead times but related with data processing and transfer and we we can get down we, we were able to get down to like a two hours of uh, processing and we were able to get this very high area pad these you know, nanostructures like these things here you see on the right right all right now next i want to talk about a little bit of uh, what type of cad softwares you can use to make your patterns uh i strongly recommend using the rate uh 100 you know, the voyager 100 software which has a built-in GDS editor, simply because you can make weight-specific patterns with it, such as circles, right? So that will uh, 
make your life a lot easier. Plus, uh, you can assign different DOS factors and whatnot into uh, each of specific patterns in the file. So it, it has pretty uh, useful. The downside is it's not very available. You, know, you cannot just install it on your own computer. But we do have a spare PC in the lab uh, that you can use, just so you know. Uh, it's, uh, you don't need to uh, log in or anything. Uh, but uh, just you know, try to utilize it as much as possible and uh, try to make your patterns with it. All right. If not, uh, I, again, Klayout is a great uh, open source software that can make GDS patterns uh, and it allows scripting itself in, in it, uh, which is also a, a great plus. And uh, you can just get it from this address over here on the screen, you can see. And one thing that I use very underutilized in, in the tool with, you know, among our users is the script. Right? So this is kind of something that I want to emphasize a little bit. There are different kinds of packages you can use. Uh, this. The first one is a MATLAB package, which is uh, 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 maintained by University of Alberta. And they have a rate 150 tool in there, and it's, it's a great tool. And I'll, I'll showcase it a little bit. And then you can, you know, if you're into Python coding, you know, there are great uh, GDS uh, packages again in Python. Mainly, this GDS toolkit uh, is pretty good. And in the past, I used to use this easy DXF package to create DXF files. You know, uh, but you can always create your, you know, if if you want to, you know, this this easy DXF is a bit easier than than using this GDS toolkit. You know, in the end, you can just uh, open your DXF file in Klayout and save it as GDS and bring it to the machine, right? Because, you know, I don't really recommend using DXF files because they do give errors and they don't really, they're not really that much compatible that, you know, in, in our experience in, in the machine and just don't like you know, use AutoCAD or uh, DXF files. So even if you use AutoCAD created DXF files, always open it in Klayout and just save it as GDS and then bring it like that way. Right? And Klayout is available on the machine too. You can just do it on the spot. It's not gonna take a long time, All right? Now, how can the scripting help? Uh, now, here's an example that uh, some series of devices that I had to make uh, for somebody. And, you know, there are like maybe 20, 30 different kinds of devices here. Each one has uh, two different parameters that needs to be scanned, needs to be verified. And uh, you know, if I had to draw all of them by hand, it would take forever, right? And plus, you know, after you make one device and you know the, uh, the user will request another set of parameters, then you know you're back to square one, right? So it's it's it it will it is quite tedious work. But if you can parameterize your device and write a script for it, you know, in a couple of seconds, you can generate this entire uh, GDS pattern, uh, you know, just by uh, feeding it to a list of parameters or something like that. Not only that, uh, you can individually label each device, which is very, very convenient. Anybody who created GDS patterns with different devices and you know, try to name these hundreds of devices one by one you know, would really appreciate it because you know, it's, 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 you know, it's basically unmanageable to do it manually by hand, right? But this technique, I mean, this, this uh, GDS toolkit will allow you uh, to do this kind of uh, automatic labeling stuff. Not only that, you can choose your own font to make things. Typically, when we do microfabrication, we don't like standard fonts because they don't lift off very well. We typically look for uh, ventilated fonts. You know, stencil fonts usually works very well. You know, if you can find one, uh, there are many out there. I was looking for some stencil fonts, uh, some ventilated fonts, uh, and I came across this uh, dot matrix font, and I just give it a shot, and it actually. Uh, were pretty great you know, if you look at it. And, you know, uh, it, it, it uh, under the SEM, it kind of looked cool. <laughs> All right, so, you know, you can do these kind of things uh, easily. Now, about the uh, great uh, GDS2 package from MATLAB uh, that uh, I, I was talking about, you know, this is very nice because it allows you to create weight specific objects like circles or FBMS, FBMS paths, etc. right? So that's very useful. So you can just keep, uh, if you want to make some, uh, you know, uh, uh, arrays of circles and whatnot, some plasmonic devices, uh, you can just, uh, you know, uh, just get into it and uh, create it. Not only that, it allows you to create custom uh, position lists. You know, this can be very useful, uh, minimizing your exposure times because you can create custom orders of, uh, you know, uh, stitch fields and whatnot. And 
you know, uh, Nate is doing some amazing things with it, by the way. You know, this uh, one of his position lists I found in there, and it's over 850 lines in here. You can see how many crazy stuff going on in here. You know, without a script, obviously, you know, you will not be able to uh, do kind of things. You know, I'm sure uh, he would be happy to uh, help if you reach out to him. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can help you with that as well. Correct. Right? That's a pretty uh, uh, good uh, tool to uh, utilize. All right. Now, uh, I will talk about uh, eBeam Resist a little bit uh, and uh, what we offer in the lab. You know, we benefited greatly uh, with the improvements uh, of the Resist uh, materials, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, if you have a machine that can do you know five nanometer lines, but if if your photo resist cannot uh, hold that resolution, that means nothing, right? So it, they have to be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, developed in parallel, basically. And you know we do have a very good sets of resist that you know we can do like a less than fifty nanometer uh, or even like a single digit uh, uh, nanometer scale structure. So we are kind of uh, lucky. And uh, so the, the most common resist we use uh, in the lab is a positive resist, which is uh, PMMA. And uh, that's basically what happens is, you know, it's a positive tone resist, which means whatever exposed goes in the developer. And the, the reason is that because the electron beam kind of breaks the polymer chains and makes them uh, you know, small chunks and they are easily soluble in the solvents, right? Uh, in the lab, we offer two kinds of positive uh, resists. One is PMMA. We have two varieties at the moment. There are like 5% in anisole or 2% in anisole. They will give you a different thicknesses when you spin it. And we also have this ZEP uh, 5220A, which is which has its uses. It's a bit more high, it's better resolution than uh, PMMA actually. And uh, uh, it's an expensive resist. So we have it in the lab and we want you to use it. So just uh, ask me if you ever want to use it. All right. And I'll talk about what it is good for. Now, uh, PMMA is very easy to use, right? That's why almost every lab has it and uh, in their with their EB machines and they're you know using it constantly. It's very uh, user friendly, uh, very high like a wide process latitude, which means you know even if you have some small errors and like you know put it in develop a little bit longer than it needs to be, or you know if you miss your uh, curing temperature a little bit, you know, it's not going to matter too much right uh it has pretty decent resolution and it's sort of uh, moderately sensitive uh to the electron beam exposure so you can uh, make uh, less than 50 nanometer structures with it and it sticks to everything right it's very good so you don't need to do some crazy uh, uh, uh surface prep to make it stick to your substrate so that's good but the downside is you know it's not easy it's not a good rie mess right it's it's very soft it just melts in the RIE, right? So you cannot really use it for an edge mask, right? Uh, for, you know, some tips for new users over here, you know, just start using PMMA. You know, if you just uh, learn, just started using e-beam lithography, just, you know, uh, if you can't make something work with PMMA, you know, odds are you cannot make it with any kind of advanced resist, right? Uh, if etching is your priority, if you need to etch your sample, you can always uh, make a liftoff process with PMMA and make a metal mask on your substrate to use in the RA, for example. And the second one we have is this uh, ZEP uh, 520 uh, in Anisole. And it is, you know, it can be spun about, spin about like 100 to 250 nanometers with the uh, composition we have in the lab. And it has high sensitivity and high, it has higher sensitivity than uh, uh, PMMA, so your dwell times will be shorter. Uh, uh, so you know, technically, you can be exposed faster than uh, PMMA. That's not very much, and it is sensitive though. So you know your process uh, latitude is kind of a little bit narrow, and uh, you know you, you do have to make it uh, uh, constant. Like you know, you need to take. Uh, great care when you use this. And it does have some adhesion problems with uh, oxides, nitrides, and most classes, right? So you may need to use like a surpass uh, 4000 maybe or some uh, HMDS or something like that, right, to make it stick. And uh, it's not very good for liftoff processes, just so you know. Uh, you don't want to uh, use it for liftoff because it doesn't give a decent undercut at 50 kV, especially. 
but it is excellent in RI, right? So you can make uh, quite high selectivity uh, when you use uh, with, you know, with, uh, reduced oxygen in your uh, edge chemistry. Right? And here's an example of that. So this one uh, I made with like 200 nanometer uh, uh, ZEP resist uh, on, uh, used the deep array, but it wasn't the Bosch process, just uh, use it regularly and you can call it like ICP array. And now uh, I was able to get more than 400 nanometer deep, so which gives you more than uh, twice the selectivity. So you know, uh, in most applications, this should be good enough, right? All right. Now, negative resists, sorry. Negative resists are usually a pain to use in uh, e-beam lithography, but we do uh, offer them uh, because sometimes it is more, uh, it's, it makes more sense to use a negative resist depends on uh, what you want to do with your sample. In this case, uh, electron beam uh, just uh, cross-links the polymer uh, inside the resist and then it makes it uh, resistant, resistant to the uh, developers so that it stays, right? So whatever exposed stays on the surface, right? So that's how they work. And in the lab, we have one Novalak resist that's called uh, negative liftoff resist 2035. Uh, that is uh, what we use as a negative resist in optical lithography as well. It's uh, actually uh, quite thick, supposed to cut like more than three micron, which is extremely thick for e beam e lithography applications. But uh, we have a, a solution that can uh, dilute it. So, you know, we have it's uh, 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 thinner, so you can just use it in a diluted form. And you can dilute it yourself to your own uh, you know, uh, specification, by the way. Now, the HSQ is, uh, the, uh, is the resist for EBL lithography for years uh, uh, in, you know, in the uh, negative resist, I should say. Uh, but the problem is, you know, it's extremely expensive and it has a very, very short shelf life. We did offer it a little bit and uh, not many people used it and it kind of expired and we cannot really use it again. Uh, so just so you know, if you have applications for it and if you promise us to use it, uh, you know, in a short amount of time, we will get it for you. But for as of now, we don't have it in the lab, but we did. Uh, uh, offer it uh, in the past. All right. Now, how the envelope works? You know, we just need to dilute with uh, SU8 developer. That's the uh, developer thing uh, I was talking about. You know, it's relatively cheap compared to you know HSQ alter or other alternatives, and it has decent RIE resistance, so you can uh, just uh, use it. They these negative resists kind of known to have like hard time stripping after uh, you expose the thing. You know you expose it, you make your mask, you etch your sample, and then you need to remove the resist, right? That, that's, that can be a little bit tricky. Uh, I have a, a solution for that. It's coming it's just uh, in a few slides, but uh, typically, you know, this this one is quite sensitive to E-beam resist. It's a lot more, so like 10 times more sensitive than the PMMA, which makes it hard to control for high, high resolution patterning, but for you know, anything larger than 200 nanometers, you should be able to use it for no problem. But you know, just remember, these kind of negative resists are prone to uh, like what we call skirting. What happens is you, know, you uh, expose the resist in this area, but due to the uh, uh, scattered electrons, we will have this kind of like skirting effect uh, on the side of the things. And the reason why it's so hard to uh, control is because of sort of like these proximity uh, problems. For example, if you look at these letters, you know, this S letter uh, exposed pretty well, but in, when you check this uh, letter E, since in this junction over here, we have more area that is exposed, we have more uh, proximity going on and we have these like uh, uh, shadowy things. These are all these like scurry things that are happening at the bottom. So whenever you have more exposure uh, than this uh, and other parts, uh, you know, it, 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 it does uh, do this. So it's just, you may need to uh, do some proximity effect correction even uh, if you need to make like dense uh, patterns like this. But if you have some sparse patterns, this is not going to be an issue, right? So that's that. Now, this contrast curve uh, thing is something that you can utilize actually. Uh, it is a great tool and it's an easy to use tool to check the health of your process to check the health of the resist you're using, right? So it's it's very easy to 
do. You just make these uh, small boxes and you just uh, change the dose from you know, low dose to high dose. And you can just, uh, if you want to go technical about it, you can just do a DECTAC scan or status profilometer scan across your uh, structures once. And then uh, you can plot these contrast curves that will give you the, uh, uh, you know, uh, your uh, proper dose and whatnot. But uh, I mean, this this topic needs uh, another talk of itself. It's a pretty deep thing to do, but you know, just you know, as a takeaway from today, you know, if you include these kind of things, even by just looking at the color after you develop the pattern, you can tell if your process is consistent with what you have been doing in the past, right? So if something starts to shift, you can tell. You know, it will give you a clue that you know something is not right, right? So try to take advantage of these kind of shapes in your designs, right? Now. If you want to get nice looking, very clean results, you need to uh, like consider some of these things. And some of them are trivial, uh, some simple things, but you know most of the time, you know because of like time constraints or you know users being impatient and whatnot, you know, they can be skipped easily, but they do affect your end result quite uh, greatly. So, like substrate cleaning. You know, how you uh, spin your photoresist, obviously your exposure parameters will be uh, important and how you develop it is important because you know you can use different techniques, you can different, use different combinations of the uh, like uh, different uh, uh, developers and whatnot. You can use room temperature or cold developing, you know, that's all important. You can use uh, some different methodology uh, things to characterize or just to uh, inspect your patterns and see uh, if, if everything went okay. and Obviously, the pattern transfer is a big aspect, but you know, when you etch uh, your substrate, you know, how it goes, or when you do a metal deposition and lift off, you know, what is the end result, right? So things like that. So now, the cleaning is the easiest thing you can do before you spin your photoresist, all right? So if you're working with silicon uh, wafers, you know, try to use uh, different solvents. You can use uh, acetone and IPA. They don't help that much, to be honest with you. Uh, you can use NMP. We have it in the lab. and uh, Or you can even go to NanoStrip and just do a little bit of a, a, a sulfuric acid bath. You know. If not, you, know, you can try oxygen plasma as well to remove organics. Right? Typically, dipping it in HF uh, it, uh, helps remove uh, native oxides and you know that will in turn makes your uh, resist bonding to the silicon surface better you know uh, those kind of things right obviously you don't want to uh, do uh, hf dipping with uh, oxide substrates right uh, and then if you are using uh, group uh, three fives or uh, you know uh, two sixes you know they usually have their own dedicated cleaning routines so just follow them you know make sure of using your like sulfuric acid baths or you know so uh, hydroxide baths and then you know use them as uh, spin dry and whatnot. So, you know, people working with these materials usually are aware of these kind of uh, techniques. So just stick to them if you uh, use them. Now, a lot of our users use this uh, two-dimensional materials, graphene and things alike, you know, and they're very fragile. We know that, you know that, and cannot really use any of these harsh cleaning techniques we use for other uh, blank substrates. But, you know, what the single advice I can tell you is, you know, if you're growing uh, these materials in a house in your own lab, you know, as soon as you grow them, if, you're, if you know you're going to do some EV lithography on them, just spin your resist uh, right away. Right? Don't wait too long, right? Because they will get uh, affected from the environment. Right? So just uh, that's that's the one thing I can tell you about. And also uh, just uh, consider doing the dehydration bake before you spin substrate right this is quite crucial uh, uh we all i mean even i almost you know always uh, skip this step but uh just if you have a critical sample just uh don't be uh lazy just uh, do this dehydration it doesn't take long you just set your hot plate temperature to more than like 120 degrees c and just bake it for a couple minutes and the longer is the better obviously but you know, uh, even that will help great with your results all right and Obviously, you know, this uh, goes without saying, like, you know, you have to clean your wafers if you're going to clean them immediately before coating, right? Don't clean them today and, you know, uh, next week, you know, try to spin coat them. Then it just doesn't, uh, you, know, it, you know, it will get, uh, you know, dirty again before uh, you can do that. After you spin uh, the resist on your sample, then you can just uh, cover them with like aluminum foil or something like that. And, you know, they will stay forever. Don't worry, right? 
All right, uh, so then, so this is another thing that can help you. So these are some uh, clever uh, designs that you can incorporate with your uh, design, like maybe your patterns on your sample. On, you can actually uh, put them on every sample you make. They don't uh, going, they're not going to take too long to expose actually. So just uh, just a piece, you know, a small advice to you. You can get these uh, focus stigmator check targets. You know, these are pretty clever things. And if you have something off, like your focus is off or your stigmator is off, uh, you'll see like some uh, weird, uh, instead of having these uniforms, so you'll have some gaps in one or the other direction and whatnot, that that, that will tip you uh, that, okay, something went wrong. Especially if you are doing uh, like less than 100 nanometer uh, plasmonic structures or something like that, these will help greatly, right? You can just put some one corner and just check it under the microscope. You don't even need uh, SEM for that. And again, you know, these uh, contrast curve patterns are quite good. You know, you don't need to go to through the motions of measuring them, but you can just check which one is clear, which one is not clear. That way uh, you can have uh, uh, an idea of, you know, how, the, how your process is holding up. And you can make some vernier scales like these and put them between your stitch fields. Now, it's not very practical in uh, most applications, to be honest with you. But you know, if you have space in there, you try to incorporate these so that you know at least you can keep track of uh, you know how is the stitching accuracy goes. Right. All right. Now, insulating substrates. Now, almost half of our users use insulating substrates in the lab. If you are willing to use them, you should know that you know, insula insulating substrates are not very welcome with uh, any kind of electron beam tool. You know, this goes for uh, uh, SEMs as well because of charging, right? So charges accumulate on the surface and they start to repel each other. And in some instances, they burst like these spectacular uh, lightning forms on your substrate. Uh, but you know they do cause like warping and uh, infield shifts, positioning uh, inaccuracies and whatnot, right? So what you can do, you can use uh, charge. You, sh you must use charge dissipation layers, right? We have this discharge H two O. It's a uh, it's a uh, product. It's a trade name for a, a, so a water soluble conductive polymer. It's very easy to use. After you spin your resist, you spin this on your resist. And you don't even need to bake it. You just put it in the uh, machine, and it doesn't alter your exposure parameters, right? So whatever uh, my, uh, microcoulomb per centimeter square, those value you're using, it doesn't going to change that. And it is very effect effective up to like one nano amps of beam current. I used it uh, about uh, like uh, six or seven nano amps of beam current. I did start seeing some positional in inaccuracies uh, at that point, but you know they do offer at higher concentrations of this uh, discharge H two O, so that might uh, help actually. And uh, most of our users actually do use this five to eight nanometers of gold deposition on their resist, and that also works quite good to uh, reduce the charging in the on the surface and. You can go even up to like uh, 20, 30 nanometers of uh, gold deposition, by the way. Remember, this is a 50 kV beam and it will just go through it, right? So if you still see charging effects uh, with uh, five, eight nanometers of gold, just try increasing it, right? It's, it's, it's not going to hurt. I mean, you may need to compensate with the, uh, uh, exp you know, the, uh, your dose a little bit if you go to like you know, 20, 30 nanometers of gold. But you know, if you want to use the HC mode in the machine with like 20 nanometers of beam, Current, you know, obviously the five to eight nanometers of gold, it's like they do nothing, and you, know, you might want to use a bit uh, thicker gold layer. All right, now some liftoff issues, right? So this is the uh, another common problem that can happen during pattern transfer. Now e beam evaporation is not very ideal, right? Because of this thing called well breaking radiation. That's the uh, uh, the English uh, word for it. I cannot pronounce that thing. Uh, that means like you generate a lot of X-rays uh, while doing the beam evaporation, which exposes the PMMA and crosslinks it uh, quite a lot and makes it difficult to stir, and that will cause uh, failures in uh, the liftoff process. All right. So, what you can do is thermal evaporation. Right. So, not every metal is compatible with thermal evaporation, but most common metals are, and we do have a thermal evaporator in the lab. So just use that instead, right? 
And we recently actually modified this tool to be able to put some ice packs on top and you, your sample is uh, mounted right on, under this cover over here so that you can keep the sample as cool as possible during the uh, evaporation. I just recently uh, was able to evaporate 100 nanometers of chromium and lift off uh, perfectly. So just so you know, it is, uh, it is pretty easy to do. So use uh, thermal evaporation, not EV evaporation where applicable. All right. All right, so now, uh, finally, you know, it's a uh, yeah, few uh, things, you know, most users do know these things, but you know, if you're new, you know, if you are into these kind of uh, uh, thick metal liftoff processes, this is something you can utilize. Uh, that is called a bilayer liftoff process. In this case, what we do is we first spin a low molecular weight PMMA, and then we spin a high molecular weight PMMA on top of it, right? You can adjust the thickness of these layers based on your metal thickness requirements, obviously. And you just expose it as usual and develop it as usual again. Uh, the, what happens is this low molecular weight PMMA is going to develop faster than the, uh, the other one on top, which will give you these nice undercut profiles. And when you do your metal deposition on it, and it will uh, you know, strip off very nicely, right? So you have very nice and clean edges. So try to uh, utilize this, especially if you are making anything thicker than 30 nanometer, like lift off. You know, with, you know, 30 nanometer lift off most likely can be done with a single layer PMMA 998.5, right? So no problem. But if you want to make like 50 nanometer, 70, 80, 100 nanometer, or upwards of that, you definitely need to use this kind of a procedure, right? It does require a little bit of process control, but because if you have dense patterns, like you know, if, if this is too small over here, and if this kind of develops uh, too much from the sides, and this can collapse, so you do have to be a little bit careful with your developing in that regard. So this is an example of uh, that quantum device I showed earlier. Uh, so this is how I did it, and I used the uh, PMA four ninety five A three and A two nine ninety A two, and you can see the. Uh, spin conditions over here. This was on a, a, a perovskite site substrate or something like that. And this this is actually done in two steps. Uh, so first I did uh, the uh, chrome gold five and 70 nanometers. And then the next uh, step was the this uh, 70 nanometer flat. Now I had to use e-beam evaporator for this because uh, we cannot do platinum in the uh, thermal evaporator but you can see the difference it makes from the edge profile just by using the E-beam evaporator and having no adhesion layer at the bottom. This chromium is the adhesion layer and the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, user didn't uh, want chromium under this platinum layer, right? And what happens is the gold in the E-beam evaporator requires a little, not very much current to uh, evaporate. It can uh, melt it pretty easily. But platinum requires a lot of beam current, which means a lot of X-rays in the chamber. So that's why you know, the uh, PMMA kind of loses its integrity in there. But again, still, you know, I was able to do this with this bilayer process in both cases. And you can see how well machine does this alignment. Right? You see that we have this two uh, 80 nanometer gap in between these two electrodes, and uh, they were aligned almost perfectly. Right? So, all right. Now, this is a new thing. I've never tried this. I heard this from a talk of uh, one e uh, rate uh, scientist and uh, it seems to work pretty great. So I'm just going to go through it and maybe you might want to use it with your processes because uh, I had some users who were having difficulty stripping off the uh, end loaf from the surface after the exposure. So in this case, what we do is we use PMMA as a protective layer of sort at the bottom. And then uh, we use some sort of a negative resistance. It can be HSU, NLOF, MAN. So these are different kinds of SUS. We don't have MAN, but you know, we do have, uh, well, uh, we may have HSU and we have NLOF. So you spin it on top of it. And then uh, we expose it again as usual. You develop the top layer as usual. The developer for this uh, NLOF is not going to attack PMMA. So it would stay just uh, as is. And then what we do is we put this in oxygen plasma. Since PMMA is not going to help very well, you know, it will get stripped a lot faster than this uh, uh, end loaf resist on the top. 
you will get this nice undercut profile under it. And then you can make your traditional lift up. And since PMMA is sort of like easier to uh, strip, it will take off this residue of your negative resist uh, from the top, right? So this can work in two ways. And you don't need to do metal deposition and lift off. I see sometimes people use this negative resist to mask something like a two dimensional material and etch away the rest. You can still do that. You know, you can just do the oxygen plasma here and you get rid of PMMA and then your material and the uh, the protected part will stay the same. So no problem there. And then you can strip this off with acetone or NMP uh, very easy, all right? So uh, uh, just to give it a try and let me know how it goes. All right, and this is my last slide. So, uh, Obviously, you know, uh, some of you are just starting, some of you have a lot more experience, but, you know, it's always uh, good to find some people who knows uh, a lot of stuff. And this guy is a pretty cool guy. He's an a application uh, scientist, a senior application scientist of great. And he, he holds office hours and a lot of slides. I actually uh, take it from his uh, presentation here today that I shown you. And uh, you, know, you can just call the guy, just send him an email, and he's more than happy to help you uh, with your process uh, issues and whatnot. He can give you some directions and you know, do troubleshooting for you if you want to. So just uh, 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 leverage the guy, all right? And he's a pretty cool dude, actually. He has he lives in like mountains of California with his horses and whatnot. All right. Okay. So thank you very much.